assuming most people are already here. Uh, Stephanie Douglas is here with us. She's visiting um, this island until or through Wednesday, and then she's going over to Oahu and going to visit IFA Manoa. Um, earlier last week, um, she was in Waimea for a Keck run, um, and uh, it's her first time to Hawaii, so be nice. <laughs> uh, uh, so she started off in undergrad at Franklin and Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> which I just learned is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, then went on to grad school at Columbia uh, University where she worked with Marcel Agueros. Uh, and she has just started within the last few months a um, NSF fellowship um, at the Smithsonian Observatory um, at the CFA. So uh, I have been telling, giving her tips and tricks on dealing with Smithsonian <laughs> uh, rules because that's what I was a Smithsonian um, Hubble fellow. And when you're there, you know, you're either Harvard or you're Smithsonian and your health insurance is different and all sorts of things are totally different. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, with that, she's going to tell us today about a lot of work she's been doing on um, the relationship between stellar rotation and how it affects um, magnetic activity and um, all of that stuff. Go ahead. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, oops. Um, so yeah, so my thesis, which I just finished in June, uh, focused on open clusters and studying the re relationship between stellar rotation and magnetic activity. Um, and I'm also very interested in how multiplicity factors into this. Um, so please feel free to stop with me with questions in the middle um, if you want. Uh, it's kind of, the talk is kind of in two parts. So if we just sit, if you have a lot of questions and we only get through the first part, that's fine. Um, <laughs> And a quick thank you to my collaborators. So my PhD advisors were Marcel Agueros and Kevin Covey. Um, I've also had a whole host of great collaborators in this, um, including the uh, folks down at the bottom here on various thing, various aspects of this work. So the sort of basic background or motivation for why, for my work is understanding exoplanet host stars, because we can only understand any planet that we detect as well as we understand its host star. Um, and so we often think of this in terms of just planetary radii, which we can only measure as well as we can measure the stellar radii. But it also comes down to things like how much high energy radiation is the, um, is the planet receiving uh, and how old is the system. So young planets are probably pretty inhospitable. So this is an artist's conception of early Earth. There's lots of geologic activity going on in volcanoes. Um, the atmosphere is probably not, it's probably still hydrogen and helium, not oxygen. Um, we have things like the late heavy bombardment um, constantly hitting the Earth. So probably if we find a young exoplanet, it is probably not a great place to live. Older planets, on the other hand, are probably a little bit more pleasant. Uh, but this, of course, <laughs> depends on who you ask and when you ask them and where they live. So the challenge that we're facing is how do we figure out how old isolated field stars are? So this is just showing an HR diagram with uh, evolutionary tracks. So luminosity and temperature, um, the, these tracks down here are older, these are the younger stars. And if we have a high, a high mass star that evolves fairly quickly and changes its luminosity and temperature, um, if we can measure those things fairly accurately, we can get a decent age for even an isolated star. If we have a low mass star, for example, a solar type star or lower, they basically don't change for billions of years. And so our normal ways of figuring out how old these stars are don't work very well. In 1972, though, um, Andrew Skumanich noticed that stellar rotation measured by V sine I and uh, magnetic activity measured by um, the calcium H and K lines decline at about the same rate um, with age uh, as stars age, which is T to the minus one half. Granted, he did this with like three data points. This is the Pleiades, <laughs> this is the Hyades, and this is the Sun. And this is uh, Ursa Major, I think. Um, but it actually turns out that for solar type stars, this has turned out pretty well. And so what we think is going on um, is this feedback loop between rotation and activity. So we have a rotationally powered dynamo producing the magnetic fields. So this is the babcock lighten model in particular, where you start out with a dipolar magnetic field and the field lines come out the top and the bottom. Um, and eventually, due to differential rotation, you, uh, the star twists its field lines up into a toroidal pattern. And eventually, those sort of twisted up fields um, will 
raise buoyant loops that pop out through the star's surface. And it's um, acceleration of charged particles along those lines that causes magnetic heating and then excess emission at particular wavelengths as the atmosphere cools off again. Finally, um, we have reconnection. So we had two loops here that then um, reconnect. So now we have one loop that's more straight up and down um, going back to a poloidal field. And then you have the loop firing off uh, out into space, which if it's big enough, we get things like CMEs. Conversely, um, the rotation slows down over time as mass and angular momentum are carried away due to magnetized winds. So this is a picture of the sun. Um, the closed loops are the places where we get the most magnetic activity. And then um, the red lines are showing open field lines. So this is the slow solar wind back here. We get very fast solar wind through things like coronal holes, where you just have lots of open field lines carrying away mass. Um, and if they're in the um, star's midplane, then they'll carry away angular momentum as well and slow the rotation down. And that leads to a weakening of the dynamo over time. So as I said before, the Schumannish law works and is pretty simple for solar type stars on the main sequence. So here, faster rotation is down in this case because we're looking at a uh, rotation period instead of V sin i. Um, and this is age again. So um, Eric Mamajek has updated the Skumanich plot with a bunch of clusters. And, um, and the solar type stars in these clusters do appear to follow a Skumanich type plot. Um, although Jen Van Sater is over at Hawaii, I won't get into this, has found that at the older ages, things might be a little funky, but I won't get into that. Um, however, things get a bit messier if we start getting to things that are not going to lower masses. So here, this black line, or sorry, this is a model where you have three stars that start at the same rotation speed, um, but they're three different masses. So initially, the solar type star spins up a little bit as it contracts, and then it spins down basically along the Schumannich law, either minus one half. But if we have a half solar mass star and a 0.1 solar mass star, uh, these things, we can see that they don't behave at all like the solar type star. So they take a lot, much longer time to spin up because it takes them a longer time to reach the main sequence. And then they're spin down once they're on the main sequence. And the only thing that's affecting their angular momentum is these winds. Um, it also doesn't follow the t to the minus 1 half law really at all. And so currently our models of angular momentum evolution don't match this mass dependence very well at all. And so what my work has focused on is trying to empirically calibrate rotation as a function of age. Um, and the way we do that is largely with photometric rotation periods, which on the sun, this is somewhat easy to measure because we just watch the star spots go around and around. Um, this isn't perfect because the spots don't last a full rotation, but it's close enough. Um, on a star, on the other hand, we're just seeing the collected light that's effectively like, well, some young stars probably have one big spot around their poles. But basically, we're just watching the star get brighter and dimmer as the spot rotates in and out of view, and then measuring the, the period of this oscillation. This gets to be a challenge as you go to older stars because their spots get smaller and their rotation gets slower. So this is supposed to be sort of a young star, a teenage star, and a solar type star. Um, and they probably do have like multiple spot groups, but we don't, really all we see is the dominant spot group going in and out of view. And so um, for young stars, they usually are fast with fast rotators with big amplitudes. And as they get older, their periods get longer and the amplitudes get smaller until a solar type star is a serious challenge to detect um, after a year or two. Um, and so where we're doing this empirical calibration of, of rotation over age um, is in open clusters, or where that's where I'm doing it anyway. Since um, unlike with isolated stars, if we assume all the stars in a cluster formed at the same age, then we can fit isochrones to the whole sequence and figure out how old everything in the cluster is together. This is the Hyades um, in particular. Um, and so then we can build up an evolutionary sequence of open clusters. So I'm going to go over sort of broadly what um, the sort of generally accepted or generally promoted uh, evolution of rotation as a function of masses. This is basically following Barnes 2003. Um, and then later I'll talk about why ways I think that might be wrong. Um, or one particular way. Um, so the basic idea is uh, young stars, this is the ONC, one or two million years, um, are born with sort of a spread of rotation rates of about 10 days. So they go from almost a day with a few faster ones 
up to maybe 10 days. And the usual explanation for this, for the spread is due to various varying disc locking life, lifetimes, that the discs act as an angular momentum sink until they dissipate and then the stars can spin up. By the time we get to 100 to 150 million years, the age of the Pleiades, um, we can see we're starting to form this distinct slow sequence, especially for the FGK stars. Um, and then you have a spread in rotation at pretty much all masses, and most of the M dwarfs are still rapidly rotating. <coughs> then the higher mass stars start to spin down. So this is M34 at 200 million years, and the sort of FG stars are mostly on the slow sequence. Um, and then uh, so below a solar mass, things are still pretty spread out. So the idea goes that the high mass stars spin down, then sort of the next mass and the next mass, uh, until you get an entire slow rotator sequence. So the age of Persepi and the Hyades, um, or Hypera as my PhD advisor likes to call them, um, <laughs> the sort of nominal transition from this slow rotator sequence to a spread in periods is at about 0.6 to 0.7 days. These stars are definitely binaries. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit later about why this picture might not be perfect. Um, eventually, all the stars um, con uh, sorry, converge onto the slow rotator sequence and continue to spin down. So at about a giga year, everything is, is on the slow rotator sequence. Two and a half giga years, this, that sequence is continuing to slow down. And then again, we get to the solar, type, uh, solar age and M67 at four giga years, and um, they're even slower. But what you may have noticed about these plots is that there's no M dwarfs here. Um, so in these older clusters, even just at a giga year, um, there's like one uh, Ruprecht 147 M dwarf for the period. And so trying to constrain the rotation evolution of M dwarfs, we're restricted to field stars. So Kepler and the Mirth survey have provided a lot of rotation periods for M dwarfs, including fully convective M dwarfs down here. Um, but we don't have ages for these stars. We can do statistical things about what's their galactic height and their um, UVW velocity, to, um, their kinematics to figure out, okay, roughly the fast rotators are this age and the slow rotators are this age. Um, but if we want to know for sure how fast M dwarfs are rotating at a particular age, the Hyades and Persepi are our bridge to the field stars because they're the only clusters, the oldest clusters where we can measure uh, M dwarf rotation periods, and in many cases, M dwarf activity. Um, so this is just showing uh, the open clusters, all the open clusters that are known from either the old web database or uh, more recent statistical analysis. As the Hyades is the closest open cluster to the sun here, and Persepi is um, about the same age, and again, the oldest thing that's kind of relatively nearby. Ruprecht 147 is right here, and even that we can't measure M dwarfs in at 300 parsecs. So what sets the lower mass where you can get the rotation? Um, so the, the challenge is being, is getting precise enough photometry for a lot of stars in the field. Um, so the, for example, Ruprecht 147, like those periods are from K2, which I'm gonna talk about for Hyades and Persepi. Um, so in theory, it's got, it should have really precise photometry. In a lot of cases, the cluster wasn't centered. So in a lot of cases, um, the, they didn't get a lot of the M dwarfs, but also you have to get the noise floor down. You're looking at things that are less than a percent variable um, and their periods are like 30 days. And so getting the precise enough photometry, it's still possible that we could get there, but it's gonna be a challenge. Um, so the Hyades is the nearest open cluster to the sun. You're probably all used to seeing at least the giant stars in it because um, this is the head of Taurus. And these four giants, are the red giants in the Hyades. Um, Aldebaran is unrelated. Um, so it's about, it's 47 parsecs away on average, um, and it's very bright, which means it's in a lot of archival surveys, um, although in some cases they're too bright, but it's very spread out on the sky. So the Hyades cover about 70 degrees, 60 to 70 degrees in both RA and deck. So even if you take a fairly big ground-based camera like PTF, that's a few degrees on each side, it's gonna be pretty hard to do almost any kind of survey of the Hyades, but especially if you want to do a time domain survey of all of its cluster members or candidate cluster members, I don't think there's anybody who's going to give you that telescope time on a telescope that could really push faint enough to get the M dwarfs. 
So before K2 came around, does everybody know what K2? I realized I started and jumped into this. I, I thought I had slides in here for that and I just realized that they have not shown up. Okay. Um, so K2 is the Kepler mission that was uh, um, pointed at one area of the sky for four years with very stable pointing to look for exoplanets. And there's a lot of great stellar astrophysics that's come out of that. Um, then uh, in 2013, uh, the second of its four reaction wheels broke, which meant it can't point very precisely. Um, so their solution was to lay it down flat in the ecliptic plane where the, they could best sort of mitigate the effect of the solar wind pushing the spacecraft around. Um, and so now they're doing sort of 70 to 80 day surveys of, of fields in the ecliptic. Uh, and so the Hyades and Persepi are ecliptic clusters. And so we've been able to use K2 to survey them. Um, there's, uh, I think I have a slide later. There's some pointing issues that have to be mitigated in the data. Um, but overall, it's vastly more sensitive than what we can get on the ground. Um, so prior to 2014, um, the Heidi's observations of rotation were primarily limited to either targeted observations, that's these points where people in the 80s and 90s pointed their telescope at like five Heidi stars and measured their light curves for a month or so um, and measured a few rotation periods. Then, like I said, the, um, the cluster is close enough um, that it appears in some all sky surveys, so things like ASAS and SuperWASP, where um, they're looking for transients or transiting exoplanets, and they're mostly limited to, to sort of brighter stars in the sky. So this really filled in rotation for the, the FGK stars and a few of the early M dwarfs as well. Oh, here's the K2 slides. Yeah, so Kepler has a very precise detector with very precise pointing. K2 is still that same precise detector with really problematic pointing, um, which, um, so for example, uh, this is showing a Heidi star over the course of the campaign. Um, every 30 minutes, it takes an image, and every six hours, you can see it drifts over, and then it jumps back, and it drifts over, and it jumps back. And that's a very exciting uh, signal to take out of the data. So uh, that was my, uh, focus of my second paper in 2016, um, where I ended up measuring um, rotation periods for uh, 47 out of the 64 Hyades that were targeted by K2. Um, 38 of those were new rotation periods, and this is just showing the light curves for, Hyad, for 30 Hyades. Um, the yellow is the beginning of the campaign, and blue is the end. This is one of my favorite stars, because it's spot signal, like just flat lines within 70 days. That's how fast the spots are evolving on some of these stars. Um, other ones are like very, very stable. Um, this one or this one. Um, so we get this sort of whole zoo of light curves. What's the, um, what's the scale on the y-axis? Mm -hmm. uh, it varies. Um, they're anywhere from half a percent to four percent variability. So is that upper left one, does that just have a high frequency variation? There? Yeah, so that's a pretty fast one. Um, so it's got a high frequency and a low frequency. He, oh wait, sorry, which one are you looking at? Oh, the upper left. Oh yeah, this one might just be... Or is that just noise? That might just be noise. It's coming out blurry on here. I can show, there's some other ones later. I show, I'll, I have some other curves later because they're really fun to show off. <laughs> um, so uh, with K2, we measured the first rotation periods for fully convective hides. Um, so those are things um, below 0.3 solar masses. And so um, this is really important, important because the Hyades is the nearest open cluster and it's, it's used as a benchmark for a lot of stellar properties um, and its M dwarfs are accessible. We can measure, target it with say, X-ray telescopes with UV on HST and we are going to do that. Um, and so now we have the rotation um, measurements to complement that other benchmark data and understand how rotation is affecting um, properties of these low mass stars. Persepi, on the other hand, it's a little further away, about 180 parsecs, um, and it's slightly more compact. It's like seven degrees um, in each RA and deck. And um, so it's a little easier to survey. So here's the PTF footprint again. Uh, we did a campaign um, observing Persepi with PTF uh, a few years ago. Uh, but then this is the campaign five footprint, and the blue targets are the almost 800 stars that we observed out of 1,100 members with K2. 
Um, and for this, uh, again, here's the zoo of light curves. Um, we, uh, I was able to measure 677 rotation periods, so that's 88% of the whole um, target list that we looked at, uh, and 471 of those are new. So we basically tripled the number of known rotation periods that we had in Persephone with K2. Uh, here you can see, since you're asking, here's one with both low frequency and high frequency variations. How, how were the targets selected? Um, so I used the cluster membership list that was compiled by Adam Krauss. Um, so that's a, mostly a proper motion of photometry selected list. So we will be updating all these lists with Gaia um, as the new releases come out. Most of these are too faint to be in TGAF, um, but we'll be looking at them again with Gaia. Um, Is this figure published anywhere? No. Oh. I feel like I should because it's the one that everyone loves every time I give a talk. <laughs> I feel like I, I've been wanting to like adapt it somehow and like print it on a dress or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't actually put this into my, into my paper. Um, uh, and so, uh, so this is the period mass diagram again. Um, so batch rotation, higher mass. We reverse it because we're looking at modeling it after color. And uh, so all the red points are the new rotation periods from K2. Solid points are nominally single things. Open symbols are candidate binaries. And the handful of crosses are confirmed binaries. Um, and so in this case, we weren't pushing new mass regimes in Persepi. But what we were able to do is go from just kind of outlining where are the fast rotators and where is the slow sequence um, for the first time, we can really look at what's the distribution of periods in the Hyades and um, better compare them to models. How do, you, how do you estimate something as a binary? How do you determine it's a binary? Good question. So in this case, there's two different ways. Um, so down to about here, about M0, um, we, they're photometric candidate binaries for the most part. So we've laid them on a, on a color magnitude diagram and looked for the overluminous stars. Mm -hmm. um, actually, most of these um, are either stars where we detected two periods in the K2 light curve, which I have some of their light curves uh, in a couple slides, or they're things where we could tell that there's like a semi-resolved, like so the K2 chips are huge, they're four arc seconds on a side. I guess I shouldn't say huge because test is going to be worse, but um, they're big, and so if there was something that was like partially resolved in like SDSS that it looked like there was something else in there, they're tagged as a binary. A lot of those are probably not binaries, um, but we've at least tagged them as candidate binaries. Um, and so with these light curves, for example, we can resolve star cloud evolution. I think this is actually the star you were asking about before. So in this case, this is one with a fairly rapid uh, short rotation period and very rapid star cloud evolution. Um, here's my favorite flatliner again. Here's one where a secondary spot sort of disappears, or at least things get a little more symmetric. Um, so here's one that's changing just very smoothly. And these are all in the Hyades. We also have about 10 to 15 percent of the, of the um, K2 targets in each cluster, and pretty much all of these are M dwarfs. Um, we find two periodic signals in the data. So some of them are pretty clearly binary related. Um, so here there's one with a long period and one with a short period laid over top. Um, and then these ones, we also see a lot of stars with beat patterns. Uh, and in some cases, these might be uh, differential rotation. Um, so we've only listed the, the things flagged as binaries on the previous slide. They're only listed if uh, the separation between the two peaks is larger than, it, than we'd expect for, for um, differential rotation based on the sun. Um, suppose someone said this one can't be differential rotation, but I can get a clear explanation of why. Um, we also found four eclipsing binaries in Persepi. Um, three of them are M dwarfs, and one of them is a G dwarf. And so um, these are going to also end up being very important benchmark systems. We've uh, Adam Krauss published a paper recently on that one. Um, and so this le led me to my next question, which is, do all rapid rotators have a binary companion? So again, uh, the solid symbols, we're back to the Hyades, um, because, uh, so Persepi has not had 
a whole lot of binary surveys done for it actually, whereas the Hyades is probably the best surveyed open cluster when it comes to binaries. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the comparable rotation period analysis yet. Um, so the solid symbols are at least nominally single stars. Um, some of them are actually single um, or probably single, and some of them haven't been surveyed yet. Um, open symbols, again, are candidate binaries. In this case, these are basically all photometric candidates. And then uh, crosses are confirmed binaries. Most of these are spectroscopic binaries, and most of these are visual binaries. Um, and so in this case, in the Hyades, basically anything that's rapidly rotating um, is a binary. I will say I do not trust either of those rotation period measurements. They aren't from K2, and I've looked at their light curves, and they're a mess. I can't find, I actually can't find the periodogram peak that they claim. Um, and they also haven't been surveyed for binarity. So, but aside from those, basically everything rapidly rotating above the fully convective limit is a binary. <coughs> Unfortunately, we can't confirm this with Persepi because it hasn't been nearly so well surveyed. Um, so down to like 0.7 solar masses, um, there's been at least some binary surveys done. So that's where the handful of crosses that you can see come from. Um, but mostly we're restricted to candidate binaries in Persepi. But um, in that same mass range above about 0.3 solar masses, more than 50% of the candidate binaries, or more than 50% of the rapid rotators are candidate binaries. And so this could be a physical effect um, that could actually change the rotational evolution of these stars. It could also just be something that leads to bias in our analysis of the period mass plane. For example, uh, so I measure masses by taking the absolute K-band magnitude of these things and, and converting that into a mass with volumetric correction. So if we, which means that the masses of all of these binaries are actually overestimated by some fraction, depending on whether they're, uh, what their mass ratio is. So that would just mean you sort of shift everything over to the right. Uh, and you can see, especially it's especially obvious for the um, slowly rotating binaries that you need to shift them into the line. Um, the other challenge, as I mentioned before, is sometimes we have two stars that are blended on the CCD. Um, especially if we have two periods, like actually, this is a ground-based light curve that actually has two periods in it. Um, which means the flux is probably overestimated if it's a binary, and then sort of which star goes with which period leads to some uncertainty in how we set up the period mass plane. Um, so visually what this, even if all we're seeing is just an observational bias and not a physical effect, um, this means that the, the transition from a slow rotating sequence to a widespread in periods happens at a lower mass than we previously thought. So even my first paper, um, and my advisor's work said that in Persepi and the Hyades, you went from a uh, slow sequence to a spread in periods at about 0.6 solar masses. Assuming that um, if we figure out that all of these stars are binaries, then everything down to 0.3 or 0.4 solar masses is slowly rotating, which means that um, if sort of theoretical models, and I'll get to this in a bit, theoretical models are trying to model there's still being a spread in rotation periods here where the models only assume single stars, um, then um, the models are drastically off in how angular momentum evolves for a single star, or at least the initial conditions. Uh, so why might uh, stars and binaries be rotating faster than their single counterparts? So the sort of first invoked explanation for this is tides. So you have, um, a central star and an orbiting object. And so the central star is tidally deformed. And then as it rotates, if it's rotating faster than this, the other things orbit, um, you'll get a differential torque. So it'll be pulling on the close side less than the far side. And it'll eventually slow the stars, or depending on how it is, probably um, speed up or slow down the star's uh, rotation period as it circularizes the binary. So within about uh, rotation periods, uh, or sorry, orbital periods of about 10 days, you expect to find circularized binaries that are uh, where their spins have been spun up to match the um, orbital period of the outer star. This only goes out to periods of like 10 days. You get like 20 stars in a cluster that are 
binaries that are really this close. So that can't be the only explanation, and it probably isn't. So in 2007, Sir and Maibom took the M35 cluster, which is about 150 million years, and he said, okay, I can say that this set of stars had, he kicked out the stars that might be tidally interacting, and he said, I'll put all the binaries with uh, orbital periods less than five AU in one bin and single stars and wider binaries in the other. So black are the close binaries within five AU, and then the dashed lines are um, either single stars or binaries wider than five AU. And so he just made this cut arbitrarily. But what he saw is that the binaries, the closer binaries, um, their rotation periods um, are on average about two times as fast as the single stars in the wider binaries. So even if we've gotten beyond the tidal limit, something is still making binaries rotate faster than their single counterparts. So the general explanation for this is that it has something to do with the disks on the, their disks on the pre-main sequence. So this is from Rebel 2006. So it's, this is infrared excess um, and a histogram. The dashed line in the background is the slow rotators in four star forming regions, I think. Um, so about like half of them have infrared excess that indicates a disk, and about half of them don't. The fast rotators on the other hand that are this solid histogram here, um, almost all of them are in the no disk category. They aren't showing infrared excess. And what this means is if they don't have a disk, even at this young age, it means that they can they, they don't have that angular momentum sink. And so they're able to um, spin up as they contract rather than losing angular momentum to their disk. Um, and this lets, them, uh, this lets them stay or become and stay faster rotators at a younger age. Um, and this effect probably goes out to about 40 AU. So this is from Cieza et al. And the, so the red, um, so this is, sorry, binary separation distribution here. And the red dashed line is stars with disks, so with the infrared excess. And the blue line is stars without a disk. And the majority, um, and so there's most um, stars and binaries with a companion less than, uh, within 40 AU don't show disks, or sorry. Most of the binaries without disks are in binaries uh, with, with orbital periods less than 40 AU. So this suggests that we should see this effect of um, we should see a, a separation dependence um, on the rotation periods of binaries. So within about 40 AU, we expect to find them rotating rapidly. And then the slow rotators should be binaries <laughs> wider than 40-ish AU um, or single stars. And I don't have the plot in here, but um, Messina et al. just this year found that that cut was at about 80 AU in the beta pick moving group. So that's only like 25 or 30 stars. So it's not a um, a very big sample, but we are starting to see evidence of this. Um, so going back, so this is the MyBomb plot again. Um, so, and I've uh, cut the same mass distribution, so solar type stars in the Persepi and the Hyades. Um, but here we don't have the separation information. So black here is just any binary and the dashed lines are the nominally single stars. So some of them are single and some of them are binaries. What we can see is that most, again, most of the rapid rotators down here are binary stars. And these are probably the ones um, within like 40 AU with orbital separations within 40 AU. These are probably the wider binaries. Um, but we need more data to sort of confirm this. And so um, coming up, uh, we've got my collaborators and I have a bunch of approved programs to start looking for binaries, mostly in Persepi, also a few other clusters. Um, so we've got WIN um, and MMT, and the, um, we were just approved for the trace spectrograph on the Till and Gas Telescope at, uh, at FLWO to um, do RV surveys. And um, last week I was attempting to look for visual binaries among MDORFs with NERC2 at Keck. Uh, and the sky did not cooperate. And by so. visual, you mean interferometric? Inter yeah, AO <laughs> binaries. <data>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've intended to just go, just go spectroscopic and visual, which is not no, actually. It's the right term. I just, yeah. Um, it's more subtle distinctions, I guess. Um, so hopefully, we'll be able to actually look at 
this uh, binary separation, um, how the rotation periods of stars and binaries depends on their orbital separation. That's going to be at least another year. Thank you to the weather gods. Also, the, the fiber placement robot on Hector Shell at MMT broke, um, and we won't have that back till the spring. So. Um, so the other, to change gears a little bit, um, the other uh, project that I've been working on with these rotation periods has been comparing to magnetic braking models. Uh, so, the, um, so the black points are the Heides and Persepi rotation periods that I showed before. Um, circles and pluses and crosses and, uh, are candidate and confirmed binaries. Um, and then these blue stars in the background are the um, angular momentum evolution model from Matt et al. 2015. So what Sean did is started out with a, a synthetic cluster with roughly the same rotation period distribution that the ONC had, so sort of a spread between one and 10 days, and then lets the stars evolve as though they have, lo hey, he models them losing their angular momentum as though they had a solar type wind and a solar type mass loss that's where the torque is just scaled by the mass and the radius of uh, of the star, and he lets the star's mass, the star's radius evolve. And so, at and so, this is the model at about six hundred and fifty million years. And so, what we find is that the slow FGK stars on the left and the fast mid M stars are well pre reproduced by this model. And Sean's is actually kind of the best model that I've seen. Um, and it does get these. So that tells us something is right in, um, in the magnetic field assumptions for those stars. Uh, he also uses a solid body model. He doesn't include uh, differential rotation um, either in the convective zone or between the core and the envelope. That's pretty typical of most of these models. For the early M dwarfs, however, um, the model doesn't really match at all, and basically no models do. So um, Sean's model predicts that at the early, for the early M dwarfs, near, that all of them should be rapidly rotating. Um, there's no model stars up here. Observationally, though, more than 60% of the early M dwarfs are up here. The slow rotator sequence just continues right on over down to the fully convective boundary. Um, and so this suggests is that these stars are breaking far more efficiently than we would expect just from a solar wind type model. Or sorry, from, from solar-like mass loss. We can also see this looking, um, comparing to rotation distributions in the Pleiades. So the, the triangles now are the Pleiades rotation period distribution from Rebel et al. This is also K2 periods. And so you can see the slow rotator sequence right here um, that has evolved just a little bit up to Persepi for the FGK stars. In the Pleiades, nearly all of the M dwarfs are rapidly rotating. So what Sean's model is predicting is that those stars have not moved very much in between 125 million years and 650 million years. Whereas what we're observing is that nearly all of them have spun up or have spun down and are on the slow rotator sequence over that time period. I think I have a, a fundamental question. So if you okay. go back to the, uh, sorry. the Hyades, what, what causes the, the dispersion in period <coughs> when you're looking at a, um, you know, a single mass. Ah, so what's usually invoked for that is different disk lifetime is, is well, this is the model. I'm, oh, what accounts for the model? Yeah. Uh, the initial condition. So he starts with a spread oh. at a spread in rotation period oh, at a given okay. mass. Okay. He starts with sort of it's log <coughs> uniform okay. between and like one was and ten the same days. Age, and, and that would be a single mass. Yes. But it's a dispersion in the initial conditions. This dispersion in the initial conditions. Yes. Which is usually attributed to disks and I think is significantly affected by binaries. So, so as that, well. So the initial conditions actually follow that there's a smaller dispersion at, at higher masses? Ah, so the initial conditions. No, so the initial conditions, uh, sorry, this is going back to the stuff I showed at the very beginning. The initial conditions is a log uniform distribution basically at every mass. And then they, so first the higher, so everything 
sort of evolves a little bit on the pre-main sequence. And then the higher mass stars mostly spin down. So this is the result of magnetic breaking here. Um, and so is some of the evolution over here. Um, but mostly the idea is that they should, at least what people, what the sort of best theory says is that these are all still showing the spread and rotation rates because they haven't braked significantly. They've spun up a bit on the pre-main sequence, but they haven't really been significantly affected by magnetic breaking. And what we're seeing is that actually they have. Any other questions before I leave for period mass plots? Uh, so recently, uh, Garrett Summers has taken just a slightly more quantitative look at this difference. Um, so the blue points here are, um, are the Pleiades rotation periods for uh, um, three different mass spins in the, yeah, three different mass spins in the M-dwarfs. And the, the solid lines are two different, two of Sean Matt's models showing uh, the angular momentum that has been lost, but their angular momentum relative to upper SCO. So taking upper SCO as like the initial conditions. So the Pleiades stars have lost a little bit of their angular momentum and the models model that pretty well. Now the purple are the Persephi, um, excuse me, period distributions. And again, so here's the, the mid M dwarfs. The models do pretty well here. The early M dwarfs are a little bit low and definitely too low. They've lost way more angular momentum than the models are predicting. And so one possible explanation for this is that, um, that, that M dwarfs have significantly different magnetic field geometries than we kind of expected, which people, um, you may have heard talk about. What were the differences before. between the two models? Um, he, uh, just slightly different, um, it's the same basic equation and there's slightly different coefficients for some of the terms in the solar wind model. That's really basically the difference. So they're, they're very, I mean, you can see it. So they're, they're basically very similar. They might have slightly different initial conditions as well. Um, yeah, I think it's just slightly different uh, angular momentum loss terms. So what we think is happening is a difference in the magnetic field geometry. So broadly, if you have a strong dipolar <coughs> and axisymmetric field, so uh, dipolar is that kind of like in at the top, out at the bottom, very simple um, field. And an axisymmetric field just means uh, it's symmetric about the rotation axis of the star. Then this should lead to more efficient angular momentum loss, both because the, they, you still have prominent open field lines in the um, rotation in the equator, equatorial plane of the star, um, and you, yeah, that's the basic reason. However, if you tilt the field and kick it off to the side, um, or if you close these field loops at the, um, at the sort of mid latitudes, that significantly reduces um, the angular momentum uh, loss rates because they can't, the star can't shed uh, mass as efficiently. Is just because the equator is moving faster? Is that, or is that um, so you need you need open field lines in the equator because if you're shooting mass off at the this is just this, it's oh, uh, this torques. Yeah, if yeah, you're yeah. shooting mass off at the poles, it's not going to change the spin mm -hmm. of the star. So right. you yeah. usually the how it ends up working is that there are sort of closed groups loops right at the equator. So the loss mostly takes place the the mass comes off at kind of mid latitudes and follows the lines out into the mid plane. This is work by Cecilia Garafo. Um, and Sean's work has also shown this as well. Um, so the, the plot on the next slide is lovingly referred to as the confusogram um, it, because it tries to represent like seven different properties, stellar properties on the same plot. Cool. So the main things that I want you to notice <laughs> are that big red um, rounder symbols or pentagonal symbols are strong axisymmetric compoidal fields. These are good for better, for breaking. Little pointy blue and green symbols um, are weak and or tilted and or multipolar toroidal fields. Um, so closed, more closed loops. Um, these are bad for breaking. So this is 
mass going this way again, faster rotation is down. Um, and so the main thing I want you to notice is, so this is a, um, the line is at half a solar mass, so about the beginning of the end dwarfs. Four massive stars are mostly those blue and green pointy symbols. So the magnetic field geometries of these stars are not well suited to breaking. Most of the young M dwarfs over here have the big red symbols that mean their magnetic field geometries are well set up for magnetic breaking. Now there's a few other uh, more complex fields in here, so there's some stuff to get into with bistable dynamos and, and different geometries, but for the most part, young M dwarfs, young rapidly rotating M dwarfs have field geometries that are conducive to efficient magnetic breaking. And this could explain their more efficient spin down in their first sort of 600 million years. Um, and so what this tells us is that we need more information about M dwarf magnetic fields um, in order to uh, improve models of rotational evolution. So to summarize so far, um, the, we've measured over 700 new rotation periods in Persepi and the Hyades using K2. And we will get a few more K2s going back to a couple of these clusters in the next, uh, well, it went back to the Hyades three months ago. It's going back to Persepi Saturday. Um, most of the rapid rotators in at least the Persepi and the Hyades and probably other clusters are binaries. And some slow rotators are also binaries, so we need to look at what's the dependence of rotation period on orbital separation. And finally, uh, M dwarfs at about 600 to 650 million years, or early M dwarfs anyway, spin more slowly than we predicted, which is evidence for more efficient magnetic breaking. Um, so I have another section of this talk, but it might take longer than 10 minutes to go through. So um, I can keep going or I can just stop. Can you do it quickly? <laughs> no. <laughs> I can, I can, well, I'll do it without the science. I'll just show this bit. So, um, the ways that we're trying to invest, to look at um, the magnetic field geometry of these stars um, is by using their activity tracers. So these, even in the Hyades, um, uh, the stars are too far away to, the embers are too far away to measure their magnetic fields directly. So if you have very close, very bright stars, you can use Zeeman Doppler imaging or Zeeman broadening to look at the effect of the magnetic field on particular, um, on particular metal lines. Um, but you need things that are like brighter than I of nine, I think, something ridiculous. And so um, the way we're trying to do it is by comparing different magnetic activity tracers that are formed at different levels of the atmosphere. So this is a picture of the sun actually, showing the same active regions. This is an H alpha picture. So you can see the, um, you can see the sunspots here. Then this is a picture in the UV. So this is the same active region, but now you can see the really bright loops um, on top of the region. And this is the x-rays. So the loops are even bigger. You can see, you can kind of start to see the loops in this picture. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not great on this screen. They're um, filamenty. Sorry? They're filamenty. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so the goal is um, depending on, so there's a couple different theories of, um, there, there are some different theories about how the magnetic field behaves when you have faster, slower rotators. Um, and most of those theories were created to predict, to explain what the x-rays were doing. Correspondingly, they also should, um, some of them predict that the UV and the H alpha, which are formed in kind of, the, these are formed in the chromosphere and x-rays in the corona. Um, some of the theories predict that the x-rays and the chromosphere commission should behave the same. Um, and some of them predict that they should be different. So if we can check, if we can compare the, the different activity tracers, um, then we should be able to, um, to, to tell, sort of discriminate between these two magnetic field theories. So I did, I did compare H alpha and x-rays for Persepi and Heidi's stars in my first paper, my 2014 paper. Um, and we found that they do behave differently, but not in the ways pre exactly predicted by either of the theories. Um, and then the cluster, looking at M37, which is slightly younger, they, the H alpha and X-ray um, activity behaves, behaves drastically differently. In older M dwarfs, they behave the same. So currently we're trying to investigate whether this is uh, 
the effect of biases and how we're selecting our sample, because especially the x-rays are mostly archival, um, and so they're limited to kind of bright and flaring stars, um, or whether this is actually an age effect, are we seeing some kind of evolution in how that these uh, magnetic fields are behaving? Uh, so this, that project is now mostly being carried out by Alejandro Nunez at Columbia. Um, he's becoming more of our activity person. Uh, so yeah, I can give more details to any, anyone if you want. Um, but, so, yep, thank you. Thank you.